Facts and Discovery Dr. Gerald C. Goeringer Dr. Gerald C. Goeringer is Course Director and Associate Professor of Medical Embryology at the Department of Cell Biology, School of Medicine, Georgetown University, Washington, D.C., USA, former winner of 1989 the Golden Apple Award. Gerald C. Goeringer's Ph.D. is in Anatomy and Cell Biology. The final speaker from amongst these world-renowned scientists will now tell us, as all the others have, that the scientific knowledge that was only available to mankind in the last century or so is in complete harmony with the Qur'an. Mr. Chairman, eminent scholars, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted and honored to have this opportunity to uh, be here before you and share some of these uh, magnificent experiences with you. Uh, in this paper this morning, we attempt to briefly outline some of the milestones in the history of embryology by way of setting the stage for the analyses of most of the other speakers who will follow. Regarding many of the points we emphasize, you will recognize pertinent passages in the Holy Quran. Let us commence with a fundamental question of biological science, a question that has commanded the attention of scholars and scientists from the earliest recorded history through today. It is a question that is also documented in the Holy Quran. Simply put, it is how does man develop? This question rings through the centuries, and the record of our attempts to answer it comprise much of the history of science in general. Therefore, the history of embryology is linked inescapably to the history of science in general, inasmuch as embryology deals with the genesis of all higher life forms, it is also closely related to the historical development of philosophical thought. Indeed, the scientist of not too many years ago referred to himself and was referred to by others as a natural philosopher. In broad terms, we can divide the history of embryology into three phases. The first phase, which we can call descriptive embryology, traces back more than six centuries before the Christian era and extends forward into the 19th century AD. This was the time during which observations of developmental phenomena were recorded and interpreted in various ways. Some of the earliest records survive from the fourth, fifth, and sixth dynasties in ancient Egypt. The official title, opener of the king's placenta, is on record as being held by at least 10 successive individuals. Later, a standard representing the royal placenta, we have the first slide, please, was carried ahead of the pharaohs. The properties attributed to the placenta were of magical or mystical significance. In fact, until the time of the ancient Greeks and after, science and magic were closely joined. It was the Greeks who elevated science into the realm of reason. This by virtue of the fact that observations were less often interpreted in terms of the mystical, but rather in the light of reason. 
In point of fact, were it not for a number of Arab writers, many of the earlier Greek works would have been lost to us. During the 16th, but especially in the 17th and 18th centuries, scientific inquiry flourished, and the works of Vesalius, Fabricius, and Harvey set the stage for the era of microscopy. This was a period of lively debate. The spermatozoan had been discovered, and the questions of preformation, spontaneous generation, the egg, ovism, and animalculism were endlessly discussed and debated. Now this is rather short shrift for three exciting centuries, so let us just briefly look at some of the things that were seen as they were seen during this time. First, some illustrations from the literature of midwifery during the 16th century. Next slide, please. Showing how from a coagulum of blood, in the upper left, and seed, a fetus develops, which can be traced down through to the lower right, where in the imagination of the author of this work, from this blood clot, a human fetus actually arose. Menstrual blood was commonly thought to give rise to the embryo uh, during this time. Before discussing the rise of experimental embryology, let's turn for a brief moment to the instrument that capped the progress of descriptive embryology and which is used just as frequently today, albeit in somewhat more sophisticated form, the microscope. Next slide, please. This 17th century development led to the publication by Ham and Van Leeuwenhoek of the announcement of the discovery of spermatozoa. Next slide, please. Published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. This is 1677. Illustrations of human spermatozoa published in 1701. Next slide, please. Are seen here uh, grouped among uh, illustrations of sheep sperm. What marvelous times these were. What controversies and arguments raged over observations made and or imagined. Look at this illustration of human semen. Next slide, please. This is the homunculus, which we have seen many times during this uh, Congress. But look at this photograph from my own laboratory just a few years ago. Next slide, please. Although this is part of an experiment unlikely to have been considered during the 17th or 18th centuries, it is not too difficult to imagine how different structures could be imagined uh, to exist in spermatozoa. With all this remarkable progress, much of what we have discussed has already been described and with infinitely more elegance in the Holy Quran. Recent analysis of passages from the Quran reveals a description of human developmental stages from the earliest through and beyond organogenesis. No such distinctive and complete record of human development existed before the Quran. It was many centuries afterwards that the human developmental stages were recorded in traditional scientific literature. With the benefit of historical perspective and the accumulated wisdom of those who have gone before, we are in a position today not only to appreciate the remarkable contributions to science of these giants of the past, but just as importantly, we can better appreciate how much we still do not know about development. The advances of modern developmental biology raise as many questions as they solve. And the physicians and scientists of today are perhaps more than ever before in need of the wisdom and counsel of scholars and religious leaders. It is not surprising then that we relook to, uh, to our holy scriptures for help and enlightenment. From what stuff 
hath he created him. From a sperm drop he hath created him and then moldeth him in due proportions. Surah 80, Ayah 18 and 19. Thank you very much.